On this week's episode, we'll be talking about two individuals from the Vanderbilt Empire and how one narrowly eluded setting sail on the maiden voyage of the Titanic, which later ended in one of the most devastating disasters in maritime history by rebooking on an earlier passage aboard the Olympic. The other Vanderbilt, a number of years later, boarded the Lusitania and within a few days of its voyage was torpedoed and sunk by a German U-boat, causing further devastation and lives lost. Amongst this, we recently visited the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina, and have some artifacts to show related to these maritime disasters which are on display there. So keep it right here as we set sail for another riveting episode of History and Relics. George Washington Vanderbilt II, also referred sometimes as the third, was born in 1862 and was the youngest of William Henry Vanderbilt's children and grandson of Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt, founder of the Vanderbilt Empire, who made his wealth in shipping, steamboat operation, and the railroads. George wasn't too keen on working in the family business, but he inherited his father's love for the arts and was an avid collector of various forms of artwork and books. Upon William's death, the Vanderbilt fortune was passed down to his children. George's brothers handled the shipping and railroad businesses, while George pursued his passion of the arts. George traveled to Asheville, North Carolina, and was entranced by the location. Little by little, he purchased land until he had 125,000 acres. It was in 1889 when construction of the Biltmore began, and it became his family home when he married Edith Dresser in 1898 who was the great niece of Hamilton Fish, who was a former U.S. Secretary of State, a U.S. Senator, and New York Governor. George and Edith traveled extensively to fill their home with Oriental carpets, tapestries, antiques, and artwork, including paintings by Renoir and Whistler, as well as a chess set that was once owned by Napoleon Bonaparte. Still owned by George Vanderbilt's descendants, it remains one of the most prominent examples of Gilded Age mansions and is the largest privately owned home in the United States at 178,926 square feet. After spending the fall and winter of 1911 in Paris, George was ready to come home and he booked the first class cabin on the Titanic for him, his wife Edith, and daughter Cornelia, as well as a second class cabin for their footman Edwin Charles Frederick Wheeler. The Titanic was the largest ship of her day ever built. She was built by Harlan and Wolfe in Belfast and was 882 feet long or more than double the height of the Great Pyramid Giza and only about 180 feet shorter than that of the Eiffel Tower if they were set side by side. She had 46,000 horsepower and could cruise at about 21 knots. She was branded as unsinkable. By March 29th, correspondence from George to his estate manager confirmed passage via the Titanic. However, by April 2nd, plans to board the Titanic reversed and were replaced with bookings aboard the Olympic, which was scheduled to sail out a week earlier on April 3rd. George and his family later made it back to New York on April the 10th. The Olympic, the first of a trio of White Star Line's Olympic-class luxury ocean liners, the others being Titanic and Britannic, ended up having a much longer lifespan than her younger sibling ships, lasting well into the 1930s. As for the Titanic, she did set out on her maiden voyage on time on April 10, 1912, but she later struck an iceberg on her starboard side on April 15, which led to her sinking to the bottom of the North Atlantic in less than three hours. 
taking with her Frederick Wheeler along with more than 1,500 other lives, leaving just 700 that would later be rescued by the Carpathia. So perhaps the Vanderbilts changed their booking to the Olympic for the simple reason that George Vanderbilt's niece, Edith Fabry, was already set to sail on the Olympic with her family. Since Fabry was one of Edith Vanderbilt's closest friends, they may have just wanted to spend the week-long crossing with family. Another possible reason for the last-minute change might be that the Vanderbilts were simply concerned that they would be delayed in the UK for an unknown period of time because of an ongoing coal strike. Sailings were canceled and a large number of vessels had been laid up. The strike was causing havoc with the Atlantic passengers shipping out of Southampton and Liverpool, and many vessels were unable to sail simply because there wasn't enough coal to go around. By the time the Vanderbilts changed their passage to the Olympic on April 2nd, the strike was still not over, and George Vanderbilt, not knowing when he and his family would be able to get home, took the sure thing and changed their passage to the Olympic, which they knew would sail as scheduled. As for Vanderbilt's footman, Edwin Charles Frederick Wheeler, he remained scheduled on the Titanic and ultimately was never seen again. Some say he stayed behind to accompany or otherwise watch over the luggage, but this theory appears a bit flawed. George Vanderbilt had been sailing White Star Line ships for decades, and his staff could have easily made arrangements for White Star to ship his baggage on the Titanic, which would have later been transported to the Biltmore once landing in New York. But Wheeler had a sister named Lily in nearby Bath, and very well could have spent some time visiting her. Because the Vanderbilt party was not supposed to sail out on the Titanic until April 10th, George Vanderbilt may very well have given Wheeler some time off to visit with her while he was in the UK. Once the reservations had been switched to the Olympic at the last minute, Vanderbilt could have told Wheeler to go ahead with his visit to Bath and keep his existing reservation on the Titanic. We'll never really know for sure, but this is much more plausible. Another Vanderbilt thought to have been booked on the Titanic was Alfred Gwynn Vanderbilt, grandson of the Commodore and George Vanderbilt's nephew. But Isaac Emerson, Alfred's father-in-law, received a cable in response to his asking if rumors of Alfred and his wife Margaret being aboard the Titanic were true, to which Alfred replied, Margaret is well, not on Titanic. Signed, Alfred. Alfred was never booked on the Titanic. On May 1, 1915, Alfred Vanderbilt boarded the RMS Lusitania, bound for Liverpool as a first-class passenger. It was a business trip and he traveled with only his valet, Ronald Denier, leaving his family at home in New York. The Lusitania was a canard line vessel that initially set sail on her maiden voyage in 1907. She was a little shorter than the future Titanic at 787 feet in length, but had over 76,000 horsepower and had the capacity of just under 2,200 passengers and a crew of 850. Six days into the voyage to Liverpool on May 7, 1915, just off the coast of County Cork, Ireland, a German U-boat, U-20, torpedoed the ship, triggering a secondary explosion that sank the giant ocean liner within 18 minutes. Vanderbilt and Denier helped others into lifeboats, and then Vanderbilt gave his life vest to save a female passenger. Vanderbilt had promised a young mother holding a small baby that he would locate an extra life vest for her. Failing to do so, he offered his own life vest, which he proceeded to tie on to her himself, since she was holding her young infant child in her arms at the time. Many consider his actions especially brave and gallant, since he couldn't swim and he knew there were no other life vests or lifeboats available. He and Denyer were among the 1,198 passengers who did not survive the incident. His body was never recovered. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed our program. If you like our content, we ask that you give us a thumbs up, a like, share with your friends, subscribe to our channel, and ring that notification bell so you always know when our new content is published. And all of this costs nothing but means a lot to us and keeps us growing. You may also leave us a tip if you choose. The address is provided here on your screen, and a link is provided in the description area below. So until next time, everyone, this one is history. 
Hey, and be sure to check out our eBay store under ID, History, and Relics. We're now featuring channel merchandise, starting with our new logo magnet. They're only $5.50, and net proceeds go towards supporting our channel.